Good morning, everybody. My name is Brent Peltola. I am the Executive Director at Partners in Research Canada, and I am your host for today. Just inviting in our guest who will join us. There we go. So our guest today is Catherine Ryan. Catherine is a first year PhD student in geology and planetary science at the University of Western Ontario, whose research focuses primarily on studying the habitability of Martian and early Earth analog environments. Um, I'm sure Catherine's got some other notes uh, to tell you about her background, so I'll leave that to her. Uh, without further ado, I'll turn this over to Catherine. Welcome to the presentation. Hi, thanks Brent for introducing me um, and hi to all the students I can't see. Um, I'm excited to hear your questions. Um, so we've had a, a small amount of technical difficulties um, and I, uh, my slides are not doing exactly what I want them to. However, I am going to do my best to present the presentation regardless of this fact. So um, if you give me just a moment here, I will start sharing my screen and we can go from there. Can everybody see my screen? Uh, that should work uh, well right there, Catherine. That looks good. Perfect. Okay, I'm going to play the slideshow um, and see how things go. Oh, bring your shared window to the front. That's what it wants me to do. Sorry, I'm not. Bring your shared. Can you guys see my presentation? Yeah, presentation should be broadcasting right now. Okay. All right. Everything's, everything should be good. All right, so the title of my presentation is From Studying Rocks to Studying Aliens, How to Be an Astrobiologist. So inspiration. Um, when I was in grade seven, my science teacher showed uh, my science class the movie Contact, which came out in 1997. It's about um, an astronomer named Dr. Ellie Arroway, who through listening to the signals from the stars, she discovers a message that was sent from the constellation Vega. Uh, this reveals that there is some sort of extraterrestrial intelligence that is interested in contacting humans on Earth. And the movie goes into the details of um, the political ramifications of this um, and the choice to send one human being to represent the entire planet in order to contact this outside intelligence. Um, this movie is actually based on a real person and it was very inspirational to me. I became super interested in space because of this and the movie shows this woman scientist who's going out and achieving all these really remarkable things. So, I mean, I would recommend it to anybody. Um, I ultimately decided, however, instead of pursuing astronomy in university, I wanted to pursue geology. Uh, geology is the study of the earth and all of its processes, everything from studying rocks at a microscopic level to studying earthquakes and volcanoes. Um, and I just wanted to be outside collecting samples. I liked working in the lab. And so to me, that appealed to me more strongly than sitting at a telescope to study space. Uh, in 2013. Sorry, Catherine, I'm just going to jump in. I think we're one slide behind you. We're on the intro slide. So if you want to just advance um, to your inspiration slide. I am advanced. Okay. okay. So we're not, unfortunately, we're not broadcasting that slide. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to fix this. There we go. Yeah, it doesn't want to. You give me one moment. I'm going to unshare and then reshare. Okay. Uh, how's this? Can you see the PowerPoint in like editing mode? Yeah. Okay. 
So if I, you can see my mouse moving around. Can see your mouse, yeah. Perfect, okay, I will start this again from here. All right, yeah. So continuing on, um, in 2013, I had the opportunity to travel to Southern Italy uh, with a, a, as a field trip to study volcanoes. Um, I got to watch the eruption of Stromboli, which is a small island in the Mediterranean. I was less than half a kilometer away from this and I got this photo myself. This was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in my life and it cemented my interest in studying volcanoes. However, um, the following fall at a conference, I was introduced to a group of scientists who are geologists that study meteorites. And not only that, they also study rocks on Mars through looking at data from the Curiosity rover, which is currently roving around in Gale Crater on Mars. So this blew my mind. This meant that geologists can study space, and I'd never considered this before, but every Thing that happens on a planetary surface in the solar system, Mercury, Venus, Earth, we even say the moon in this case, Mars, and the surfaces of Pluto and um, some of the moons of Saturn and Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Jupiter, these, all these surfaces are controlled by geology and they're controlled by the same laws and physical concepts of geology that we understand here on Earth. So suddenly I discovered what it meant to be a planetary scientist, somebody who uses the principles of geology on Earth to study the surfaces of other planets. I pursued studying this into um, my master's degree and I became very interested in early planetary environments. So all the planets in the solar system were formed about 4.5 billion years ago. Uh, and in the beginning, the surface looked probably something like this. Um, the surface wasn't fully cooled yet. There was a very primitive atmosphere. There's a lot of impacts from meteorites hitting the surface, just like the asteroid that hit later, much, much later hit the, um, led to the extinction of the dinosaurs. Um, and so this artist's illustration is what the early surface of Earth and Mars looked like. And uh, from here on out, I'm just going to focus on Earth and Mars. However, not long after that, uh, the surface of the planet cooled down. We had a more stable atmosphere and there was um, liquid water that began to uh, become settled on the surface, forming oceans and lakes on the, on the surface. So we had volcanoes, we had an atmosphere, we had liquid water. These are all really important um, things for a planetary surface at this time period. So during this time period, from about 4.5 billion years ago until approximately 3 billion years ago, the Earth and Mars probably looked pretty similar. On the left here, we have an image of what the Earth might have looked like. And on the right, we have an image of what Mars might have looked like. But after this time period, Mars kind of slowed down and came to a stop. We see now that the surface of Mars is barren. And while there are there is some geologic activity, mainly in the form of um, meteorite impacts hitting the planet, uh, there's some subsurface water, there's ice caps at the poles. Mars doesn't have, uh, Mars doesn't have active volcanism, it doesn't have a very thick atmosphere, and so it doesn't have very much in the way of weather, um, and it doesn't have large bodies of surface water like oceans or lakes anymore. Uh, but the Earth does. And so what this means is that since 3 billion years ago, the Earth's surface has been constantly recycled. There have been volcanic eruptions. There have been trees and life that have spread across the surface. Oceans have moved. Continents have moved. And the surface of the Earth has been constantly recycled. That means that old, old rocks 
from three billion years ago or older are very, very hard to find on the Earth's surface. They've mostly been destroyed through various geological processes. So if we want to study the early Earth, that means that we actually have to look to Mars. Mars's surface, which is old and well-preserved, can tell us a lot about what the early Earth was like. So why are we so interested in this time period from 4.5 to 3 billion years ago? Well, I'm going to introduce a concept to you called a biosignature. We all have a pretty good idea of fossils. Fossils, if you think of them, they tend to be bones, footprints, eggs, and even one of my favorite types of fossils, a coprolite, which is fossilized poop. Everybody loves some fossilized poop. However, if we want to understand how life could have formed very early on, we won't be able to look for things that are as big and complex as these fossils like bones. Um, very early life on Earth was all composed of teeny tiny microorganisms like bacteria. And bacteria are not really big enough to leave the kinds of fossils that we can easily see. But they can leave chemical signatures and very, um, uh, very microscopic traces of life within the rock record. And if we're looking for this evidence of life in the rock record that's just in very tiny, tiny amounts, that's what we call a biosignature. Um, so some of the oldest biosignatures or fossils on Earth are what are called stromatolites. These things, they don't look like much, but what they are is when bacteria forms on a rock surface, it can make like a layer, like a mat, and then um, it will start to solidify and then more layers of bacteria will form on top of that and on top of that. These structures, we actually see them forming today. This is a picture from the western coast of Australia where stromatolites are cur currently forming. But these structures that are in these rocks up here are actually from three and a half billion years ago. We have some evidence of life that's even older than that. There's definite evidence that stretches back to 3.8 billion years ago. And there's some scientists who even claim that there's evidence of life on Earth from 4.1 billion years ago. So that means just 400 million years after the Earth became a planet, we had life. And that's incredible. So if we're looking for life on Earth that's that old, we can also ask the question, if Mars had the same environment as Earth did during that critical time period, why couldn't there be life on Mars? And that's what I'm interested in as an astrobiologist. Um, we don't have rocks on Mars that show evidence of life yet, but it's been really hard to look for it as well. First, Mars missions have followed where we believe water used to be because water is one of the key ingredients for life. And from there, we've started using many different, um, many different instruments to try to detect these microscopic signs of life within the rocks. Uh, in order to test these instruments and test these techniques and try to better understand them here on Earth, we can study rocks on Earth that are from very similar environments to what we see on Mars and try to look for microscopic signs of life within those rocks on Earth. So during my master's degree in 2017, I became part of a large NASA research project called BASALT. BASALT was designed to send human astronauts onto Mars. In this case, the human astronauts were sent to a volcanic lava field in Hawaii. They were um, directed to collect samples of these rocks and bring them back 
to the lab so that we could study them with our instruments in the lab and try to understand what kinds of microscopic signs of life we can find in the rocks. So in my lab at York University when I was doing my masters, I would take these rocks and zap them with a laser and that can tell us about the um, molecules that are in the rocks and these mo or certain molecules can act as biosignatures. So by mapping the surface of this rock, I can create a map of where we find organic molecules in the rock. And as you can see, the areas where the map is red, warm colors, that's where there's high concentrations of organic material. And if we try to correlate that with what we see over here, we see that this area and this area and this area, they all have something in common. And that is they are holes in the rock that contain white material or some sort of white mineral. Um, later analysis that I did showed that this white mineral is a type of mineral that many other people have shown can be a support structure and a source of food for microbes. So that means that we're seeing concentrations of organic material in the white mineral. And that's a pretty key clue to tell us how a volcanic rock can um, have the right habitat or be able to support life like uh, microbes. And more importantly, can also tell us uh, that this type of rock and this type of environment can preserve these chemical signatures of life. This is really important because if we use these same sorts of instruments and techniques on the same types of rocks on Mars, it's quite possible that we could find this molecular evidence of life. During my PhD, I'm interested in studying a different type of biosignature. If you think of certain animals like worms or moles, they like to burrow into the ground. They will eat the dirt and poop it out the other end, and that creates a tunnel through, through the ground. Small microorganisms, single cells like bacteria, are capable of doing this in rocks. This diagram is kind of complicated, and I don't need anybody to actually read what's on it, but it shows how bacteria can interact with the fluid in a rock and create a tunnel. So I have samples from a different type of Mars-like environment on Earth that if I look really, really closely under a microscope, I can see these tunnels into the rock. Um, so these are some of these microtunnels that have been created by bacteria. Here's an example as well. As you can see, all the tunnels are coming off of this big fracture. So that means that the fracture is a source of fluid that um, the bacteria could use for eating and then they continue to eat their way into the rock. So these are also a type of biosignature. They're um, able to be detected under microscopes. And what they tell us is that the types of rocks that I'm looking at are tasty to microbes. Um, so I'm interested in studying these biosignatures and specifically studying the minerals that are around these, tool, uh, these um, tunnels and the chemicals that are around these tunnels and finding out what that tells us about what makes this particular rock tasty to microbes. Um, so these rocks were collected from an environment on Earth that again, we see on Mars. It's a volcano that's erupted into a lake and because the volcano is hot and it has lots of interesting chemicals in it and the lake has water and lots of interesting chemicals in it, these chemicals and rocks interact and they can deposit certain types of structures at the edge of the lake. 
Um, so my rocks were collected from these environments here on Earth. And what's especially interesting about this type of environment is that there's direct evidence of this type of environment on Mars. And specifically, there's evidence of these structures in a place called Jezero Crater on Mars. And what's so interesting about Jezero Crater? Well, later this year, we'll be launching a brand new rover to Mars called the Mars 2020 rover. Actually today, NASA is going to announce the official name of the rover, so it won't be called Mars 2020. It'll be called something like Curiosity or Opportunity or Spirit, all of which are names of previous rovers on Mars. The Mars 2020 rover is going to rove around this type of environment and use a bunch of different instruments to test the rocks and see if it can find biosignatures. It's also going to collect rocks and store them and later on, NASA will launch another rocket ship to go to Mars and collect those rocks and bring them back to Earth. On Earth, scientists can study these rocks with much larger and more complicated machines than we can fit on a rover. And hopefully, with all of this work and all of this sending a rover to the type of environment that we know can support life, maybe we have the opportunity to find evidence of life on Mars. So as I've hopefully explained to you, there's many different ways to be a, a scientist who studies space. Um, you can be an astrophysicist, you can be an engineer, you can be a doctor, and in my case, you can be a geologist. What I love about being a planetary scientist is that I get to use my knowledge of geology on Earth, I get to go out into the field and collect rocks and study them in the lab. So these are all examples of me doing just that, and that's one of my favorite things about being a planetary geologist. So moving on into what you guys are here for today beyond just my talk. So sorry, Catherine, I'm just going to jump in. Before we get into okay. the next section, maybe we can uh, get to a couple of questions. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll encourage any other classrooms. We have four questions from uh, Sir Adam Beck Junior School, but other classrooms, if you have questions, to submit, uh, just open the Q&A window that you can find at the bottom of your Zoom uh, page, and you can uh, type in questions there and I'll relay them to Catherine. So um, back to the, to the list of questions. The first one was about one of your early slides at the volcano, asking whether um, that affected your ability to breathe and was it scary? That's a really interesting question. So some volcanoes that have a lot of water and a lot of interesting chemicals in the lava will emit a lot of clouds of, of noxious gas. It's a big concern in Hawaii. It's a big concern in certain parts of Italy. It's a big concern all over the world where there are active volcanoes. And you can definitely see, all well, I hope you can see in this picture that there's a cloud of smoke there. Um, if the weather had been bad or certain conditions were right, then it would have been pretty hard to breathe. But in this case, I was far enough away and the eruption didn't have the right type of chemicals in it to create gases that would make it hard to breathe. Um, as for being scary, I didn't think it was scary at all. I thought it was like the most crazy and cool fireworks display that you'll ever see in your life. It was just utterly incredible. There was loud bangs as these rocks, rocks in some cases the size of a room, would be thrown out of this volcano and skitter down the side of it into the ocean. And to me, watching from half a kilometer away, wow, that was one of the best things I've ever seen in my life. That's so cool. I envy you the opportunity to have been there. Anybody uh, can travel to this place too. It's Stromboli Island and just off the coast of, um, of uh, the southern point of Italy. Very cool. Um, so another question from uh, Jessica Mahaney's class. Um, you mentioned the white material that microbes like to eat. Uh, what is that? Is there a name for that? What is that material? So certain types of minerals that I found in my rocks that um, showed that there were biosignatures in them. 
Um, I had the mineral chlorite. I had different types of clay minerals, and I had the minerals zeolite, and I had mineral calcite. And so all of these minerals are what are called alteration deposits. When you have hot fluid um, that contains dissolved substances moving through the rock, the dissolved substances in the fluid will interact with the will interact with the lava, the cooled lava, and cause chemical changes. And eventually, when the fluid disappears, it leaves deposits of these minerals behind. And all of these minerals are have been shown to be really um, to be used as support structures for colonies of different types of microbes. So a related question to that then from uh, Louis Rial Junior High in Calgary, asking uh, what are some of the minerals and microbes and bacteria, uh, that, sorry, that microbes and bacteria are attracted to that can be found on Mars? So are some of these materials there? Uh, yeah, absolutely. We have evidence from both rovers that have looked at rocks up close and from um, different types of special cameras that are on orbiting satellites that take pictures of the surface of Mars. Um, and it's shown that these minerals like zeolites, calcites, and clays and chloride are found on Mars. Um, and then a couple of questions about the rover. I'm just trying to find. So Maria Innocente's class asking how long it will take for the new rover to get to Mars. And then we did have a question about um, the impact of sandstorms and other elements on the rover. Those are both really excellent questions. So to my knowledge, I'm not, I, don't know exactly off the top of my head, but my, what I, from what I recall, that it will take about nine months to get the rover from Earth to Mars. So it's being launched sometime this summer and it will arrive on Mars next spring. Um, the other question was- uh, Damage from sandstorms and other elements. Yeah, so with, some previous rovers, including you might recently have heard of the rover Opportunity, which was launched and arrived on Mars, I think in 2004, and until 2019 was continuing to rove around. Those uh, previous rovers have used solar panels as their source of power to get around. Um, the problem with that is every so often you can have massive dust storms on Mars and that blocks out the sun and you need the sun to power solar powered batteries. So in order to solve that problem, the Curiosity rover and the Mars 2020 rover both don't use solar panels at all. Instead, they use um, a source of radioactive material that provides heat and power to the rover. So it doesn't matter if the sun gets blocked out the rover can keep going because the power source doesn't rely on the sun. The thing about Mars dust storms as well is unlike in the movie The Martian, um, Mars has an atmosphere and it has very strong winds, but the atmosphere is so thin that it's not able to pick up big rocks or big clumps of dust. The dust is like fine, like flour, or sometimes even smaller particles. So. It, the wind that's moving this dust around doesn't have enough force to really cause the kind of damage that you would see in a movie like The Martian. It's not throwing big rocks at, at the rovers, and so the dust doesn't really cause um, structural damage to the rover. It just can cause issues when the dust settles out and covers the rover's solar panels. Very cool. Uh, so one more question and then we'll jump back to the presentation and then we'll get to more questions later. Uh, Marcella Caro's class at uh, Langton Public School uh, wanted to know what happens to the lava when it hits the water? You talked about 
that chemical reaction between the chemicals in the lava and the chemicals in the water, uh, what happens when that uh, occurs? So um, when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about lava that has already cooled and turned into a solid rock. Um, lava, when it's still liquid and erupting, it can hit the water and it will instantly cool and crystallize because the water is so cold compared to the lava. But in this case, um, I'm talking about lava that is already a solid rock. And so the, as fluid moves through this lava, um, this cold rock, um, different minerals that are within the rock that do not like to be stable at the temperature and pressure conditions um, at the surface of Earth. So these are types of minerals that normally crystallize when it's much, much hotter and much, much more pressure, but then at the surface, they don't like to stay that way. As the fluid moves through, it causes these minerals to weather out or change chemically, and the fluid can pick up the chemicals from um, these weathered minerals and move them elsewhere and then interact um, the chemicals from the weathered minerals with the chemicals that are already in the fluid and create new minerals that are deposited on the rock. Very cool. Um, so let's jump back into the presentation and we'll get back to some questions uh, in a little bit. Yeah, okay. So jumping back. Um, so today, today you guys are participating in junior astronauts. Um, and one thing that's really important is that uh, your class and individual students who participate in junior astronauts can submit entries until March 29th to the Canadian Space Agency for the opportunity to go to a space explorers camp at the Canadian Space Agency in the summer. So submissions for that are open until uh, March 29th, and I encourage every student who participates in different junior astronaut activities and gets certificates, certificates that actually look like this one. Um, everybody who participates in that can submit uh, their um, entries into this competition and they might get the opportunity to go to the Space Explorers Camp at the Canadian Space Agency. So today, the, um, in the class, you guys will be participating in the Patchmaker activity. Patches are really big for astronauts. Um, different patches can re represent different things. Um, most recently, uh, the Canadian astronaut David Saint-Jacques uh, was on the International Space Station this past year. And so this patch here was designed by the Canadian Space Agency to represent um, him and his mission. Um, astronaut patches typically will have the astronaut's name, the space agency name, and some sort of meaningful image. In um, David St. Jacques' case, it shows the North Star, um, and it has different colors that represent different things that are meaningful to the individual person. So um, I actually have notes for exactly what, um, yeah, so David St. Saint, Saint Jacques uh, patch has stars beyond the earth. It has the North Star and the compass rose and four different colors that signify innovation. Um, these are other mission patches for various other Canadian astronauts that have traveled to the International Space Station or traveled aboard one of the space shuttles uh, in the past. We have Julie, Julie Payette, um, Dr. Williams, Bjarni uh, Trigveson, Mark Garneau, Roberta Bondar, um, Stuart McLean, uh, Robert Thirsk, and Chris Hadfield even more patches here. These are all available online on the Canadian Space Agency website for you to look at. Um, if you guys recall, I spoke about in my presentation how I was part of a NASA research project called Basalt. So this is actually the mission patch that was designed for 
uh, the basalt mission. And it really signifies the goals of basalt. You can see a volcano and you can see uh, a strand of DNA representing life. So it shows that um, this was a research mission designed to look for signs of life in volcanic environments. These are some patch examples that have been made by previous classes um, who have participated. Um, on, the, on the left, this was made by, a, by an elementary school student. Um, and on the right here, this was made by Sienna uh, McLaughlin, who is a student here at Western, and she works on um, developing these junior astronaut programs. So your guys' goal today is to design your own astronaut patch. Um, it should have your name, the space agency name, and some sort of meaningful image to you. Um, here's some more really great examples of mission patches. Um, and along with making your own individual mission patches, uh, there's also the opportunity to make a mission patch with your crew members, or in this case, your entire class. So with the um, class or crew, we want you to make a patch that has the crew member names, the mission number, and a meaningful image. So that's the Patchmaker activity. I hope you guys have fun today participating in Junior Astronauts. Thanks a lot for logging in, and um, I guess I can answer a few more questions. Excellent. I just ended your presentation so that uh, we can go back to just full screen. So a um, couple other questions. We are over time, but we do have uh, a number of classes still with us, so let's get a few of uh, these uh, taken care of. Um, you mentioned on a couple of occasions some of your educational background, but uh, there was a question about how do you get a job like this and what is your title? Oh, well, that's a really great question because I don't have a job yet. I'm a student and I will be a student for another four or five years. Um, <clears throat> to work in this sort of research, there's a lot of different paths. Uh, as I said, there's many people who work in space health, studying the effects of space on the human body. There's many people who do different biological experiments. Um, there's people like me who study planetary surfaces and um, astrobiology, and there's astronomers. Most of them have backgrounds that involve, at the very least, a master's degree beyond their bachelor's degree of university. Um, but I'd say a great majority of them have a PhD or doctorate degree. So instead of being a medical doctor, um, they are a research doctor. So hopefully four years from now, I will be Dr. Ryan. Uh, it might take five or six years, but eventually I will be Dr. Ryan. And people who become that sort of doctor can work for various organizations like the Canadian Space Agency or NASA. Uh, they can work for different universities or private institutions. Um, so there's a lot of different types of jobs that are out there. I don't know exactly what I'm going to end up doing when I'm finished my PhD. I would like to be a university professor, but I also think it would be pretty cool to work for the Canadian Space Agency or NASA. So I guess we'll see what happens, but at the moment, I'm just a student. Yeah, it's a, it's a long road, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna combine three questions here. Uh, Jennifer Lang's class is asking, um, how long a rover can potentially last on Mars? Jennifer, or Jessica Mahaney's class was asking if they ever come home. And um, Marcelo Caro's class was asking, how long the radioactive power source will last. So um, kind of all on the same theme, how long do they last? Do they ever come home? And how long does that power source uh, last? Okay, so I uh, can tell you that um, when the missions are designed for the rovers, it's designed with the expectation that the rover will last anything from 90 days to about a year. And then after that point, it goes into a phase what's called the extended mission of the rover. And at that point, it's just, we're going to keep going until the thing dies. So in the case of the rover Opportunity, um, 
it lasted from 2004 until 2018. Uh, so that is 14 years. Um, that was one of the solar powered rovers. So eventually it was knocked out by a global dust storm that occurred in 2018 and it wasn't able to get power anymore. Um, the Curiosity rover, since it's powered by this radioactive source, it's going to last until things break down. It's been up there since 2012 and it's still going really strong. It hasn't had any major issues yet with any of its machinery. Eventually these things will wear out because the rover is driving over difficult environments and using a lot of different moving parts and the more different moving parts you have, the more opportunities there are for something to break or wear out. But uh, Curiosity has been going strong for eight years. So that means seven years past its initial um, one year lifespan. And the radioactive source will not run out in any, like I, to my knowledge, the radioactive source can last thousands of years. The rover itself will not last that long because eventually all the machinery will wear out, but the radioactive source is not going to be the reason that the rover stops working. Um, as to the final question of whether the rovers come home, they don't. We keep them on the planet until they wear out. It takes a lot of energy and a lot of fuel and all that translates to a lot of money to launch anything from a planet's surface and bring it to another planet. And there is no real reason to bring back something as heavy and complicated as a rover that's broken. We can send new rovers to Mars. So uh, yeah, unfortunately, they'll never come home. Thanks for that. Um, so we're getting close to the end of our time, but I will ask a couple more questions. Um, Karen Davis's class wanted to know what the process is called when you're looking for biosignatures. What do you call that? Um, the, the process, you described the process of zapping the material with a oh, laser. Okay, so that was using um, a technique called laser-induced fluorescence. So when you shine a laser at, mo at molecules. Um, the laser is light that is in the form of photons or little, basically little packets of energy. And so these packets of energy get transferred into the molecule and the molecule was resting, it was kind of asleep, it was at what we call a ground state. But when the packet of energy gets transferred to it, all of a sudden it wakes up and it gets really excited. All of its bonds are moving in different directions. Um, and that packet of energy has just caused this molecule a lot of excitement. But the energy can't last forever. And because the molecule starts moving around, um, it loses some energy. And so eventually it gets tired and jumps back down to its original state. And when it does so, it releases its own packet of energy and this packet of energy or photon has less energy than the original photon. When we use a certain type of camera to detect the photons of light that are coming from the molecule after it's relaxed, um, we can see that different photons with different wavelengths of light are associated with different types of chemical bonds in the molecule. And so um, by analyzing the different wavelengths of light that have been emitted by the molecule after it's relaxed, we can understand what types of chemical bonds there are and therefore try to identify the exact molecule that we have. Sounds in incredibly complicated. Um, our last question for today, because we are well over time, um, is from Karen Davis's class asking, is it possible to find biosignatures on Mars using a rover? And if so, how would we do that? Uh, so the Mars 2020 rover is specifically designed with special instruments that could potentially find biosignatures on Mars. Um, there's a few different things that it can use. Uh, it has uh, an instrument called Sherlock that uses a technique very similar to the one that I just described with um, 
the laser causing the molecules to bounce around. And uh, that's one of the key ways that it will try to detect um, organic molecules that are specifically uh, left behind by life. Um, there's other ways like an uh, instrument that detects different types of minerals because when a microbe eats a mineral and poops it out the other end, that mineral has changed from one um, chemical state to another. And so with uh, an instrument on Mars 2020 um, to analyze these minerals, it can potentially tell if these minerals are the types that have been changed by a microbe pooping them out. Um, but the main thing with Mars 2020 is that uh, the mission is designed to collect samples that later on will be brought back to Earth. And so we can use our much better instruments here on Earth to study them in all sorts of different ways. The rover has instruments that are potentially maybe capable of finding biosignatures, but it's really hard to, if we're looking at something that's so small, so trace, just tiny concentrations of molecules that are slightly different from the surroundings, it's gonna be really hard for instruments on a rovers to detect that. It is possible, we've tested it on the ground, but it'll be very, very hard. So what's much more key is bringing these samples fresh back to Earth so that we can analyze them in our labs. Thank you for that. And um, my apologies to the classrooms that asked questions that we didn't get to today, but we are well over time and uh, need to get going. Uh, thanks to all the classrooms for joining us today. Thank you, Catherine, for your time. Thank you very uh, much for having me. It's been really great to talk to everyone to hear your questions and I hope you all um, have learned something today and can go forward and see that there's many different ways to get to space. Fabulous, thank you so much. Just to the classrooms, next week we have two more junior astronaut sessions on Tuesday, March 10th at one o'clock. Tabitha Shepard will discuss impact craters and their hydrothermal activity. And on Thursday, March 12th, we'll be joined by uh, Kamira Andres, who will present a treasure map of ice on Mars and Earth. Um, Kamira studies the movement and stability of ice in glacial and pre-glacial environments in the Canadian high Arctic and how it's shaping the landscape over time in comparison to Mars. So teachers, look for registration details in your inbox tomorrow. Again, thank you to everybody for joining us and have a good day. Take care. Bye-bye.